My name is uh, Tim, and I've had the privilege over the last uh, two and a half months to, uh, to be here with you about seven times. And it has been a privilege to be here. That uh, media that you just saw was a part of a, or kind of a setup for a teaching series that Pastor Brian has been in here at Lakeside. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, I'm just so encouraged and heartened by what God is doing right now at Lakeside. I uh, watched on Facebook the video of the eight baptisms last Sunday. Wasn't that exciting? Wasn't that exciting? Yeah. It's just uh, so encouraging to see people giving public testimony to their faith in Jesus. And the other thing that was exciting, being down on the beach in Lake Michigan, uh, there were a number of people from the city who were there, who heard and saw what was happening. And uh, I just personally find that exhilarating. Two weeks ago when I was here, I began a a two-week series in the book of Jonah, uh, a series that we're calling Jonah the Reluctant Prophet. And uh, today, we're going to be looking at uh, chapters 2 to 4 to Jonah. It's just going to be a quick run through those uh, three chapters. But it's all oriented around this uh, remarkable truth that's packed into those chapters that people matter to God. There's a picture of my uh, three daughters. Ann and I have uh, three adult daughters now. Um, Chris, our oldest, is on the far right. Shelly, our middle daughter, is on the far left. And Stacy, our, our youngest, is in the middle. And when they were quite young, I took them one evening to a mall. Anne had arranged to spend a, an evening with some of her friends, so it was Dad's night out with the girls. Chris was six at that time, Shelly four, and Stacy was two. So we entered the mall, and we went into a department store, and we were looking at some racks of girls' clothes, and as we're looking at the rack of clothes, I, I turned, and I could see Carissa behind me, and I could see Shelly behind me, but I didn't see Stacy. So I just said to uh, Chris and Shelly, girls, where's, where's Stacy? We don't know, Dad. She was right behind us. Well, initially, there was concern, and then there was alarm, which prompted a full court press. I told Chris and Shelly to stay together at the edge of the department store, holding each other's hands, while I went into the mall to look for Stacy. And after searching stores that were throughout that mall, I returned to Chris and Shelly to see if Stacy had returned. No, they said. The distress I was feeling was really escalating now. I took a deep breath and stared back into the mall when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a merry-go-round. And next to the merry-go-round stood a little two-year-old girl with blonde hair watching with fascination. It was our Stacy. Though I was indescribably relieved, I wanted to scold Stacy and I, and, and I wanted to let her know that she couldn't wander off when we're in the mall. As I approached her and before I could say anything, she looked up at me and excitedly said, Hi, Daddy, could I have a quarter to ride the horsey? And all I could do was smile and save the scolding. And then I gave her a quarter. (laughs) Now, here's what I I think I could fairly say about Stacy in that moment. Intrigued by the merry-go-round, she had no idea she was lost. Intrigued by the merry-go-round, she had no idea she was lost. And interestingly, in the biblical story, we're introduced to lots of people like that. People who were lost, and they didn't necessarily know it. In fact, uh, this isn't just a look back in history at the biblical story. The Bible is as up-to-date as this morning's newspaper. There are lots of people today like that. People who have no idea they're lost. 
That term lost is a term that uh, Jesus used. In Luke 19, uh, Jesus meets uh, a guy named Zacchaeus who was distant from God, lost, and he didn't know it. Jesus engaged him and spent some time in his home. Zacchaeus got right with God. And at the end of that little story, in verse 10 of Luke 19, Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. When Jesus uses that expression, lost, what he is not doing there is trying to demean in any way people who are distant from him. What he's simply doing is he's saying that there are people who are relationally disconnected from God. Jesus uses the term lost. And rather than forgetting and ignoring them, God is resolute about loving people in that kind of predicament. And here's what's sobering and even a bit alarming. While God loves lost people and desires relationship with men and women who are presently disconnected relationally from Him, while He loves them, some of us who follow the Lord may discover that we lack a corresponding love for lost people. It happened to a guy that we meet in the pages of the Older Testament. His name was Jonah. And two weeks ago, we met Jonah in the first chapter of this Old Testament book that bears his name. And in that first chapter of Jonah, we discovered a guy who was on the run. Again, this is the story that we're in. Jonah, the reluctant prophet. Specifically, Jonah was on the run from God. Now, this story takes place somewhere between 700 and 800 B.C. It happened on the stage of history. God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh. The people of Nineveh at that time were a brutal people, conquering others and leveraging power. God wanted to warn the people of Nineveh of coming judgment. Jonah rebels against God's directive and he runs away from God. We're not told in the first chapter exactly why it was that he ran. We're simply told that he ran from God. We'll find out more today about why he ran as we look at chapters 2 to 4. But here's what's enigmatic about this whole thing. Jonah the prophet was a guy who was called by God. He was called to speak for God. And he's objecting to what God has asked of him. He runs as far away as he can. We saw a couple of weeks ago that Jonah boarded a ship bound for Tarshish, a destination as far removed from Nineveh as he could possibly get. Here's that map again. He entered a boat at Joppa, which today, by the way, is Tel Aviv in Israel. He boarded a boat in Joppa, and there was Nineveh up in what is now Syria, about 550 miles away, and he boarded a boat that was headed for Tarshish in the opposite direction as far as he could go to get away from God. That ship that Jonah boarded headed into a storm, and in the midst of the storm, Jonah was thrown overboard. At the end of chapter 1, Jonah finds himself inside a large fish. And inside that large fish, Jonah realizes that God has mercifully and miraculously rescued him from drowning and that God is with him. In other words, in spite of all of his rebellion and his disobedience, God has had mercy on Jonah. As chapter 2 opens, Jonah, understandably now, is just awed by God's power to save. So he says this, When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into to your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed 
I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. That final line is beautiful, isn't it? Salvation belongs to the Lord. And that announcement from Jonah, that confession of faith to God, it's, it's a confession of a man who's now gripped by God's power to save. And at the end of chapter 2, in verse 10, we read, and the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spit Jonah out upon the dry land. Nothing is impossible with God. He has power to save. So here's Jonah now on dry land with the stunning realization that he's been rescued, miraculously delivered by God. Granted, he's lost his appetite for sushi, (laughs) but he's alive. But he's alive. And Jonah has a second chance. So the story now moves into chapter 3. And this is what we read. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So on the heels of God's saving, rescuing work in Jonah's life, on the, on the heels of God flexing his muscle and demonstrating his power, how's Jonah going to respond to this recall? Remember in chapter 1, he'd run away from God. How is he going to respond now? Look at verse 3 of chapter 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Jonah appears to be a changed man. In the moment, he is evidently responding to God's call now. He's received this recall and in obedience, he heads to Nineveh. On arrival, he discovers that the city is so large that it took three days walk to walk this city. This is an epic moment. What's his message going to be now that he's arrived in Nineveh, now that he's obeyed God and responded to him? What's his message going to be? Is it going to point to the greatness of God? Is there going to be reference to God's mercy as he speaks to these people? Is it going to be an honest proclamation about the real gravity of sin? Is there going to be a compassionate appeal to trust God who is a merciful Savior? What's Jonah going to say now that he's finally arrived in Nineveh? Here it is. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. (laughs) That's it. That's the entire message. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That sermon is eight words long, only six if you read it In the original Hebrew, a six-word sermon. Some of you may be thinking, if only we could be so blessed. (laughs) Besides the extreme brevity of this message, it's incredibly vague. It lacks characteristics of most expressions of Old Testament prophecy. There's no reference to sin. No call to turn from rebellion. Most curiously, there's no mention of God. There's no mention of God. What's going on here? I thought this was a response now to this recall. What's going on here? Here's the deal. It appears that Jonah is just going through the motions. Though it appears he's dutifully serving God, there's no desire in his service. His spiritual EKG is flatlined. Now, 
This isn't a history lesson. God, the Holy Spirit's here to speak to us this morning. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? We're not here this morning to specifically talk about Jonah. We're here to talk about us. Have you ever been there? Have you ever gone through the motions in your relationship with God with very little desire and very little focus? God, who's called us to himself, finds pleasure when we trust him, when we really trust him, when we desire him. Back to Jonah's story. So after Jonah's half-hearted little presentation in Nineveh, what might you have expected in response from these people of Nineveh to this brief presentation by Jonah? Derision? (laughs) Would there have been some kind of reprisal? Anger? Look at verse 5 of chapter 3. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. Now, friends, are you tracking with this? This is mind-blowing. Really, are you tracking with this? This is what God's Spirit can unexplainably accomplish in the hearts and lives of people. This wicked, self-absorbed city is humbled with conviction and they turned to God. They turn from their sin and they turn to God. This is, this is stunning. It's like the Holy Spirit interrupted Mardi Gras And people drop to their knees before God in honest surrender. How do you you understand this other than the power of God? Jonah was a half-hearted messenger, half-hearted at best. God's purposes will prevail. And in the last verse of Jonah 3, uh, we read this. When God saw what they, the people of Nineveh, did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would bring, and he did not do it. Amazing God. Merciful God. That's what this story is about. This story teaches us so much about God. God knew in advance what was going to happen. He orchestrated it. Not the rebellion, Not the disobedience, but he was orchestrating, working through even a half-hearted messenger. He powerfully worked in the hearts of the people of Nineveh, and they turned to God. This is actually one of history's most startling, stunning spiritual awakenings. People are getting right with God. A city is being transformed. This must be the pinnacle moment of Jonah's life as a prophet, right? Oh, this must have been, this must have been ministry Camelot for Jonah, right? Actually, Jonah is ticked. Here's what we read in the first couple of verses of chapter 4. But to Jonah... This seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Why was Jonah so steamed? It's because Jonah hated these people. 
Jonah hated them. He didn't want them to taste God's mercy. He only wanted the judgment of God on them. That was his singular focus. Jonah had a perspective on mission that was really, really, really distorted. Rather than choosing to see people through God's eyes, Jonah insistently supposed that God ought to see people through his eyes. It's really, really backward. And for the record, it's not a problem just isolated to Jonah, is it? Is it? The story of Jonah can be really convicting because it may well be that when we're brutally honest with ourselves, many of us see ourselves in this story. Is it possible that some of us in this room right now may, uh, may have secretly objected to God's compassion when God mercifully works in the lives of people who have hurt us? Or when he works powerfully in the lives of people who for one reason or another were prejudiced against. I know. I mean, can we talk? You know, no illusions here. Let's just be genuine, heart to heart. You might be here today sympathizing with Jonah. And I need to tell you that uh, Jonah's story has been convicting for me. Sadly, from time to time, I see just little strains of no of Jonah in me. And it's really sobering. I'm pretty disarmed when I think of the joy that Jonah forfeited. Now hear me out on this. The joy that Jonah forfeited because of his resentment and his prejudice. He missed out in terms of celebration on one of the greatest spiritual awakenings in all of history because his heart was so cold. The tragedy in Jonah's story was this. When God did an amazing work in transforming the people of Nineveh, Jonah was unable to celebrate or enter into the joy. That's the tragedy of the story. While an astounding work of God is taking place, Jonah is sulking. He missed out because of the bitterness in his own heart. Now, I want to say, there's some important takeaways for us from this story, some important takeaways about God. First of all, Jonah's story is a story of God displaying power. This transformation of the city of Nineveh defies our assumptions. No way, no way are these hostile, hard-hearted people going to turn. This is a story about the power of God to bring conviction of sin to hard-hearted people, and God turns them. This story underscores his amazing power to transform hard hearts. And for the record, this is a story that could be a story of hope for some of us who have loved ones and friends in our circle of influence who have become very resistant to God, very hard-hearted, and at some point we may have said to ourselves, there's no way that person could ever come to Christ. And this story says, think again. This is a story of God displaying power. Secondly, Jonah's story is a story of God displaying patience. Patience is that characteristic or virtue in God that's on display with a reluctant servant like Jonah or at times like me or like you. 
We don't drift into commitment, friends. We drift into complacency. Isn't that true? You have to need to make a a deliberate, intentional choice to be steadfast, continuing to follow. You drift into complacency. We can get out of step with God. So the Holy Spirit comes to us and taps us on the shoulder and reminds us, hey, Tim, you're getting a little off the rails here. It brings me back on so that I'm positioned to see God at work, to participate with him in the outworking of his mission, and to celebrate when God does something amazing like this that can be celebrated. God could have so easily turned his back on Jonah, but he didn't. God loved him enough to keep working on him. And friends, when I look back over my own life, I marvel at God's patience. Frankly, it would have been fair if he had given up on me a long time ago. Instead, he pursued me. He loved me. One of my life verses is Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. In other words, even when my heart is not right, when it's indifferent for whatever the reason, God, this amazing God that we've come to worship today, is pursuing me. He's after me with goodness and mercy, with goodness and love. He's pursuing us. He's relentless in that with his adopted sons and daughters who have trusted him through Jesus Christ. God pursues people like us. He loves He loves it when we align or realign our hearts with his. So in Jonah's story, God displays power. God displays patience. And third, Jonah's story is a story of God displaying purpose. His purposes in salvation are mind-boggling. He does more than make us better. God makes us new. Aren't you glad? He can transform lives. While While God's desires may be resisted by mankind. He is resolute about his purposes and his decrees can't be thwarted. That's God. This story teaches us a whole lot about God. God displays power, displays patience, displays purpose. As the final chapter of this book continues, Jonah goes outside the city, throws a fit. He didn't want God to love the people of Nineveh. In chapter 4, there's this curious account of a vine that God provided for Jonah outside the city of Nineveh. And for a day, the plant provided for him shade and some comfort. The following day, the plant withered and died, and Jonah came unglued. It seems Jonah cared more about the life of a plant that provided shade and personal comfort Then for a city full of people made in the image of God, people with eternal souls who are relationally disconnected from God. I mean, let's tell it like it is. That's what was going on here. And this is what is so sobering. And when we get off the rails, we're vulnerable to that. The very end of chapter 4, God poses a question to Jonah. He says this, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? God says, they don't know their right hand from their left. They're lost, relationally disconnected from me. Jonah, should I not be concerned? Should I not be concerned? People matter to God. People matter to God. Which people? All people. The jobless guy, the homeless guy, the wealthy and successful guy with their very different needs. They all matter to God. Blue collar people, white collar people, people with real different politics than yours. They matter to God. Married people, single people, divorced people, straight people, gay people, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, deists, agnostics, healthy people, disabled people, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Wayward sons and daughters, old people, young people, women, men. People matter to God. People matter to God. 
Jonah's story emphatically announces that God who created men and women loves the people he's created. And he desires relationship with people. Now, that does not mean that God endorses all of our choices or just looks the other way as people continue in sin with attitudes and actions and choices that defy his revealed desires for us. It doesn't mean that anyone can come to God apart from Christ. What it does mean is that God loves people who he's created in his image. He took the initiative on the stage of history and provided for us the Savior we needed. We all need a Savior. We all need a Savior. And that's, friends, why Jesus came. That's why he entered history. That's why he left all the privilege of heaven to enter our mess. One day in breathtaking, crazy, and amazing redeeming love, he went to a cross outside Jerusalem and stood in our place to cover our sin. And people of all kinds can access this redemption by personally trusting him and pinning their hope on him as Savior, desiring him more than the sin that holds them captive. God said to Jonah, there are 120,000 people in Nineveh who don't know their right hand from their left. They're spiritually disconnected. Should I not be concerned? That's God. That's God. He's a God who has power and he has desire to save and redeem and restore. At the beginning, I shared that story about Stacy wandering off in the mall. You have no idea the emotion that surged through me when we found Stacy by that merry-go-round in the mall. A part of me wanted to scold her, but the biggest part of me wanted to pick her up and hold her and tell her how much I loved her. I was just so relieved. My lost little girl was found. I was so gripped with love for her. So I said to Chris and Shelly, let's not tell mom about this, okay? (laughs) No, that's not at all what I said. This is what I said. Girls, let's go home and joyfully celebrate with mom that Stacy was found and is safely home. Friends, there's a personal God in heaven today who celebrates and rejoices every time someone says yes to Jesus Christ. Every time. You better believe God was celebrating over Lake Michigan last Sunday when eight people gave public testimony to their faith in Christ. That's God. That's God. He celebrates whenever someone who is spiritually lost is found. Because you see, people matter to God. Father in heaven, God, you are an amazing God. The way you pursue us and love us the way you care for people whose hearts are hard and who run away from you or people relationally disconnected from you who don't even realize how lost they are. God, I pray that Lakeside Church would be a gospel outpost that seriously cares about the people of this Lake Shore, and that there would be a readiness here to respond to every prompting that you place on the church and on people here to go to people who today are lost so that there could be joy in heaven and so that we could share in your joy whenever, whenever, whenever we see someone who's lost. 
become found. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, this may be this may be the last time that I have opportunity to be here. It's been such great privilege to be with you at Lakeside. And I'd like to do this before the worship team leads us right now. I, if I could, I'd like to just do this. I'd like to express a blessing over you that Paul expressed over the Romans in Romans 15. Um, because this represents my longing and desire for you at Lakeside as you continue to follow Christ and learn more and more what it means to follow him. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you might, Lakeside, overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.